And a very good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Hitmix 88.9's Issues and Attitudes. My name is Jeff Owens, Director of WEIU. Our guests today are Carolyn Cloyd. She's Executive Assistant in the Mattoon Chamber. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. And the star of the show today will be Mr. Edward Dowling, a U.S. Navy veteran. Welcome, Mr. Dowling. Thank you, sir. It's good seeing you again. And I, I knew Ed uh, when I was younger and haven't seen him forever. It was, so it's been a really good day to, to see you uh, in person again. I appreciate that. Appreciate you coming in. You bet. No problem. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about veterans and, and, and your history and Carolyn's, you know, love for the community and some of the things she's done. I know today there's been a lot of stuff already happened in Mattoon, but is there anything that's still going on later today uh, in the area that people want to catch in, in for Veterans I think Day? mainly at, like, the American Legion and BFW. So um, they always open up and usually do meals, and but I think that that's pretty much it. So. Okay. And you guys, how so, didn't you have a, a kind of a an, – uh, an, uh, a veterans related event this past weekend we did it was remarkable um the rolling thunder had asked if they could put a missing man chair in our museum the coles county historical society yeah. museum so they came came in and installed it and we had the dedication on saturday and it was a packed house i mean it was it's a really touching ceremony they read stories about um the men they were men because they were from world war ii that were missing and uh uh, just to talk about those stories and tell everyone and some cute little young man brought in a red white and blue paper chain so I just wanted to point that out because we we said we'd hang it there and leave it on display forever it was a very nice day uh, so Ed let's talk a little bit about your experience you were in the Navy for a few years in the 50s you know you just talk about yourself and and what the Navy meant to you uh, Navy quite interesting and my older brother by the name of Don, who was, had been in the Navy Air Force before I was, he decided that if I was going to go in, that would be a place to go because they had a lot of good training programs. And I took his advice, went through boot camp, and, and went into aviation training. And so you've flown a lot of planes and stuff in, in, when you, in, during your career? Well, most of the time, uh, in the early part of my career, after I've gone through electronics, they made me clean the barracks. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of strange. You know, after spending all that money on me, it was like eight months of electrical physics. <laughs> However, it paid off later because it qualified me to finish my science in at Eastern. That's good. So I only had to take one other course <laughs> <laughs> to do that. But uh, that, uh, that was the experience that, that we had from that standpoint. And you ended up at aviation school and then went to Jacksonville, Florida after that, correct? And I actually went to Memphis first okay. for aviation electronics, which they, that was where all the electronics physics came from. And then after that, uh, that's what I thought it was strange. They sent me to the a Fleet Air Wing 11, which is out of Jacksonville, and then they assigned me to Patrol Bomber Squadron. You were in the uh, Navy in the 1950s. I mean, there wasn't were you weren't involved in any conflicts or anything. But talk about some. Maybe you have some serious, some memories that kind of just come to mind about being in the Navy in the 50s. One thing that I thought was interesting, I was standing guard duty in the uh, crypt cryptography room, and uh, there was a, a lot of activity down there. And I started thinking about what could that be, and I had read in the paper the about the day before that the Nautilus submarine was the first nuclear submarine. And I, my guess was that they were probably coming that way. They were notifying our local fleet air wing so they could track them, because that's what we did is track submarines. Okay. I'm going to get back to you in a minute. I want to talk to Carolyn just for a second. Carolyn, one of the things that you've always been just, you know, one of the firm uh, believers in our troops and our veterans over the past since I've known you for 20-some years, you know, where did that, where did you get your inspiration from? Was it from your father or from other things that happened or what? Well, it really, I mean, it started with my father. He was a 23-year military. He was in World War II, and then he was he got out, and he was out for two years and joined back up the newly formed Air Force and so I was uh, born on a military base, and I guess my father just taught us to be respectful and to appreciate what, what those who have served. And again. your father in World War II was one of the ones who landed on Omaha Beach? He did land on Omaha Beach. He was an engineer, and his job was, he was tasked to uh, clean the beach of debris 
which he said when he first got on the beach, of course, he was in the second wave. He said all we were doing, all anyone was doing was trying to find something to hide behind because they were shooting at us. And then later on, um, as the day wore on, he had to clean the debris, and a great deal of that debris was bodies. They had to bury them in the sand so the troops and the equipment could come through. And my dad said of all the things that he saw, and he was at Dachau, actually, when it was liberated, which was horrible. He told me about that as well. But he said it always haunted him about burying those boys on the beach because he said, he said they'd been looked at and determined to be deceased, but he said, I always in my mind thought, what if somebody was still alive? So that oh, really haunted him. I bet. He also got to serve with General Patton. Did he get a no General Patton? Or well, how um, so my dad said it wasn't like they hung out with General Patton every day, but he said General Patton was very, he really loved his engineers. He, he said General Patton would say, we're going here. And you're going to clear the way. So he was very good to his engineers. So they saw them routine. Saw him routinely. He would show up. Hey, what do you need? What are you doing? He mainly would see their commanding officer was um, a gentleman named James Anderson. He was 36 years old, so he was the old man. That's what they <laughs> called him. And so they said they'd see him standing over there talking to Patton with his, you know, James Anderson would have his hands in his pockets, walking back and forth, talking to Patton. Then he'd come over and say, "Well, the general says to do this or that." But my dad, you know, a lot of there's a lot of things said about General Patton, but my dad liked Patton. Ed, when you hear stories from that, from World War II, what kind of goes through your mind? Well, it makes me uh, happy that I wasn't involved in World (laughs) War II, but you know, these are the guys I admired because I was a kid during World War II. And, uh, but when I went in, we were using leftover World War II stuff and things are beginning to modify. But it's like, like her dad and my brother being shot down over Germany as a prisoner of war. Those are the guys I admire. Those are my heroes. Now you got some good heroes. Let's talk about your brother. He was a POW and got shot down on, you were telling me before the show, on his first mission. Right. He, they, he, he told me, it, we, it was hard to get those guys to talk about yeah. stuff like that. But uh, yeah, they were shot down on their first mission. He said they were on fire from 28,000 feet down to the ground. And they crashed in a forest on top of it, and then they were hauled off to a... He thinks it was at uh, where they fired off the V-2 missiles. So how long was he a prisoner of war? I I really don't, don't know. Know, really don't know how long he was a prisoner was of war, but I know they were freed by the Russians. Yeah, okay. He was shot down but December 6th and then okay. imprisoned, so yeah. So when you think about your brother, then when he came home, he, did he did it take him for a while to open up and, and, and talk about what happened in World War II? I remember uh, some apparently he was having night, nightmares and things because he slept upstairs from where I slept downstairs. And so I'm sure he's having nightmares about stuff like that. And but the, he only weighed about 85 pounds when he got home. Holy. But at the end of the war, he said that they were running out of troops. So the uh, Germans would put Doberman compound at at night so the men could rest during the day. But they crossed them up and they ate the guard dog. (laughs) And you talk about it to him. It was a funny story. A fellow he worked with at General Electric lived next door to him and his son came home with a Doberman one time. Holy. And he said, and of course the father knew the story. So he says, hey son, take that dog over and show it to Mr. Dowling, see how he likes it. He's out there washing his car. So he went over there and says, hey Mr. Dowling, do you like Dobermans? He says, they're better than cats. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking to Ed Dowling and Carolyn Cloy today on a Veterans Day show as we salute all veterans today. Here at WYU. Now, you, you had another brother that drove the F-4 Phantom, is that correct? Oh, he helped design the oh, F-4 helped design. Phantom. Okay. Right, go ahead. He helped design. The, he was an engineer. He was originally on a patrol bomber himself out of Iceland like I had been. And of course, he was before me by a few years. But uh, yeah, they, uh, he designed that, and then he uh, helped one of the designers of the Gemini space capsule. 
Oh, really? What do yeah, you mean? He said he about got ran over by Alan Shepard one time. <laughs> <laughs> you got some good stories. Uh, we're talking to Ed Dowling about it. He's a U.S. Navy veteran uh, from the 50s. Um, now, Ed, is, talk about your career after you got out of the Navy. You know, and, and you, I know you went to Eastern and finished up, but you know, talk about what you did after that and what, and what skills the Navy helped you with to, to move forward in your career. Well, definitely the electronics. You got that out of the way. But I, I, I went back and I thought I was going to be a, a physics major, but uh, I had done so poorly right out of high school that I decided I don't think I want to pursue that. <laughs> so I went back and, and got my degree. It only took me 10 years to get a degree from the time I started till I finished. <laughs> That's but, all right. But I had, a, I had a year on the railroad in between plus four years in the Navy. But uh, I, I, ended, I was an uh, art major. And of course, I got out of college and became an insurance adjuster, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but I couldn't afford, afford to be a teacher at that time. There you go. So I spent about five years with State Farm adjusting. Now, one of the funny stories is, kind of funny, is you got married while in the Navy, and you were yeah, honeymoon nine days, and they sent you to Iceland right. for eight months. So, so talk did. about that experience. The uh, experience in Iceland was, it was interesting. I roomed with a guy... One guy was from New York, uh, Long Island. One was from Brooklyn, and and uh, one was from uh, Queens. So here I was from Mattoon, <laughs> and all three three guys were from there, and uh, they were they were hilarious. One was Jewish, I was Protestant. One was Catholic, and we never knew what Ed Corcoran was, <laughs> but he was from Queens. We remember that. Did you get? How long did you stay in touch with those guys? You know, you uh, Al Lutron ended up over by Decatur one oh. time. They opened up the first Volkswagen dealership over there, but then later on uh, he went into another business at that time. But I had stayed in contact with him until he passed away a few years back. A serious note, you know, the veterans have a lot of issues in this country. Um, you, you've come out pretty good on the other side, I think, you know, from knowing you from the way back when time. But what are the veterans' biggest needs right there? And, Carolyn, you can help on this too. But what are veterans' needs and what can we do about it? Well, uh, what part of my career was running the Colts County Mental Health Center. I took a year off and ran that. And the veterans need a lot of help. I, kn I know several guys. Well, I had a nephew that lost his life over age at Orange and I know another one is affected by it and I know some guys that were in firefights and uh, are on medication to, to help cure that and I know that our another guy who wounded was Colonel Yuck who used to run the ROTC so those are the guys that I look look up to you know having not not been in any battle yeah matter of fact all i had to do is pull the flap off my 45 and i slowed some people down <laughs> but other than that you know i i had no qualms about it i did i did one time though i was standing a fire watch and uh, uh, some drunken marines came in the barracks and i was on duty <laughs> <laughs> and and, I, and uh anyway Ended up, I tried to call the shore patrol, and he hit me and broke my nose. Holy cow. And I was bleeding, so I told uh, this colonel recently that I was filing for Purple Heart for friendly fire. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, you're in touch with a lot of veterans in the area. You know, what services do they need most? Is there anything that can be done? Well, um, I just happen to be wearing my Coles County Veteran Support Coalition shirt. So, I mean, a lot of the needs are what you see and hear from other people, you know, sometimes financial assistance. Uh, you know, we visit veterans in nursing homes. It's certainly those veterans need that. But, you know, the biggest thing is dealing with the issues, the trauma that they've experienced in military. That's the one thing that's, you know, there's lots of people that experience trauma, don't get me wrong, but it's it's a different kind of trauma. and. Uh, they really need assistance with that and we do have a, a program with the Veterans Support Coalition called Reboot that helps veterans and their family members deal with uh, military trauma but if it's not that um, if they can get assistance somewhere else that's really what they need and 
And, you know, so many of them have a difficult time just even saying, you know, yes, I'll, I'll go get help. I, it's just the nature of it. So. It's a stigma a little yeah. bit, right? Well, and even just, it's just hard. You know, um, it's it's hard telling, talking about these things to anyone, even, even if you think they might be able to help you. So, um, well, let's break a little news here. You received a, a grant award for the Charles Blakely Hall Project uh, that hopefully WEIU will be involved with with you on, on this. So talk about what this means and what this is, and, and, and there's an EIU, big EIU tie-in. So Charles Blakesley Hall was attending Eastern Illinois University in the late 30s and early 40s when he decided to drop out of school. He was doing pre-med studies, and he was also a standout track and football star here at Eastern and he decided to drop out of school and join the military. The military had recently uh, loosened restrictions on what African Americans could do in the military. So he dropped out and became one of the earliest Tuskegee Airmen. He became the first African American to shoot down an enemy plane and he received a distinguished flying cross which then General Eisenhower actually flew in to congratulate him when he got that. So um, he's got this tie here to Eastern Illinois and so I applied for a grant for untold stories. And I'm going to say this, I'm not being critical, but when I was um, trying to do some research to do something for our museum, the Historical Society Museum, I talked to several people on campus here and none of them had heard of him. And that's just normal. Life goes on, you know, time passes, life goes on. That's that's normal, but that's why we want to tell this story because as time has gone on, you know, it's it's kind of lost, uh, you know, people, people are kind of forgetting it. So we want to remind them. And I do hope to be able to partner with W EIU to do something to tell his story with this grant. So. That's very good. And I'm sure we will be able to figure out something. And let's get back to you. When you hear stories like that and you hear and you start reminiscing today about some of your the old buddies uh, from uh, your uh, your veterans, you know, your time in the U.S. Navy, is there other good things that come to mind and maybe some friends you stayed in touch with all this time? And I know we're losing veterans at, at an alarming rate, but some of the ones you still stay in touch with. Uh, yes, there's a couple of them. In fact, I just had breakfast one and he was in the early part of the Korean conflict and he was aboard ship of course I was never aboard ship other than the visit and he always said that I was a ankle deep sailor because I was never aboard a ship but our <laughs> aircraft were too big for ships and they could be fired off a ship but they couldn't land on it because it was at a hundred foot wingspan on it oh really but then the, we were anti-submarine but there's another aircraft we flew in and we, I flew in with learning pilots. I would ride behind the student pilot, but he'd be flying blind. But I was to watch out for other aircraft along the way. And we were close to Wichita where they were flying B-47s out of there. So the convergence between aircraft at high speeds like that is just instantaneous almost. I don't know how they ever shot down any <laughs> German airplanes from those guns. I was talking, uh, talking watch a video the other day that my brother was flying in those w woolen suits with the leather and that the side gunners on the B-17 had open windows and they're flying at 50 degrees to below zero. Yeah. <laughs> so you, it's hard to comprehend that. It is. But I, when I think of her, her dad, I imagine the horror ha of seeing all those bodies. To me, that would be it's like probably the, tear me up. I would never forget it. It's like the beginning of that one movie, and I'm having a brain lock right now. What it was, but you know, that's how it started. It was the Tom Hanks movie. You know, they're all coming off and just yeah. And um, the another thing he had to do after D-Day was they had to dig those bodies boys up, yeah. back up and then put them in the temporary cemetery, and then they later on did the permanent cemetery. But my dad had to. Um, help with that until his unit not all of his unit came over on d-day some of them did and so they had to wait until july till the rest of the unit came over and um, one of the things he also said and this is kind of gruesome but he said those bodies would all be piled up there when they were doing the temporary cemetery and he said that they'd have the graves registration people out there and some of them would be out there eating a sandwich or whatever and he said it just made me sick to my stomach he said i know that they had to just sort of put it out of their minds because it would just be unbearable but he said it just made me sick to my stomach to even just think about that and how they could do that because that just 
really tore them up. But I know a lot of people, like in your dad's situation, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, they went back over there to visit, and it's really breathtaking when they do that. Was he involved in any of that? My dad did not. He just never wanted to go back. Uh, I think it would be tough. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Did he ever did he talk about it or think about going back, or was it just never? Um, I talked to him about it once, and I said, you know, if you go, Dad, I'll go. And he said, well, I'll think about it, but that's kind of as far as it went, so. Now, do you go to, have you been to Arlington or anything like that? For I did, you know, yes, we were on an honor flight. In fact, uh, you probably knew Jack Collinsworth. Jack and I went. I know the Navy. He went in the Marine Corps when I went in the Navy. And, of course, we give each other a hard time about that <laughs> constantly. Uh, any other stories that you want to share with our listeners and viewers today about being a veteran, you know, the military, what today means to you all? Well, I think, you know, a lot of those people that, that I knew that our old neighborhood had colonels and generals and everything else. And But uh, I know if, when you try to comprehend what these guys went through during Korea and Vietnam, well, you, you we've got one guy there at Mattoon that some of you know, he was a farmer, and he was wounded in that uh, battle when the Chinese chased the guys out of Korea and he was he was wounded there uh, and I remember Colonel Yuck being wounded and some of these guys that were in firefights I don't know how I would handle something like that but uh, you know it, we know that there's a lot of guys out there that are suffering for those mental things that are so hard to get over with yeah. And you didn't see any action, but you were still in the Navy for four years. D- do, you, do you regret not seeing action, or are you happy with the, the, the way that your path went? It turned out well. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I'm flying. We've flown and had aircraft problems, and I remember that. They offered one time to, if I wanted to bail out, I could. And I said, no, I'd just write it down with you guys. <laughs> and I think it was the best landing we ever made oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> of any kind. But I did, uh, and one interesting thing, that, that uh, when I was in training in Memphis, Tennessee, our last, last phase was bombing runs. And you, you did really well, I heard. And, 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 and I, I blew up the bridge there at Cairo, Illinois, <laughs> and that's why I told everybody, that's why Eisenhower had to build the interstate system. <laughs> 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 That's good. Cool. Do you also oh, talk to yeah. newer veterans from you know, the Desert Storm and the recent conflicts in Afghanistan? Do you, do you get a chance to talk to some of the, the new veterans as, po- as well? I, I have, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. Of, uh, in fact, one of them uh, is the, the site director at Lincoln Log Cabin. He was in that one of the. Is it Matthew, Matthew, Matthew Middlestead? Middlestead yeah. was there. And, of course, I remember talking to uh, the colonel about his and my and then generally copy i visited with him down in texas one time about his career and different things and of course he put out a scholarship for the rotc for a while i i don't know if he's still alive or not i if he is he's pretty well up there in years okay Carolyn, other things that you want to talk about today we got a few minutes left We're talking to carolyn cloyd and you ed dowling today u.s navy veteran um i just want to mentioned that my dad was at Dachau when it was liberated and I got him to talk about that one time and that was it and uh, when I did I told him I said you know dad people there are some people who are denying that the Holocaust happened now so I said it's important to tell your story so he did talk to me about it a little and you know as you can imagine those stories were gruesome he saw the train cars full of bodies he said when they opened the gates those poor people came out of the gates falling on the ground kissing their feet and he said it was just so shocking and so you know just something you can never forget and he said all that went through my mind was I kept thinking if we'd gotten here sooner how many more of these people could we have saved and just you know just the horrors of that the end of Schindler's List almost in real life I remember the picture I've seen is the suitcases this the stack suitcases the picture of looks like a hundred two hundred thousand suitcases and it just it just it's breathtaking when you think yeah. about it. Um, the other thing is that this is, and I don't mean Eastern to get mad at me today, but <laughs> so many places are open today, uh-huh. uh, open for business on Veterans Day, where we celebrate a lot of things in this country, superficial or not, and we don't go to work. But today we're at work on Veterans Day. Um, your, both of your thoughts on, on, on businesses being open today. 
But I tried to cash a check and couldn't. <laughs> the bank's and, The bankers and, took the and, day off. And, and, and I know the guy that owns the bank, <laughs> several of the Prairie State banks. Matter of fact, he's a local Charleston boy. So it doesn't mind but, you that people but, are open today or closed, I guess? I, no, I did go over to uh, Denny's. They had the breakfast, breakfast for veterans over there. And they had that today. Sat there with another friend yeah, who was a nice. real sailor. Yeah. <laughs> on, a, on, on board a ship <laughs> well I try to on Facebook I did my little spiel I wrote something saying you know please please do what you can to honor our veterans today because um, you know go to the parade because it's not the longest or the flashiest but it's the most important parade so I would really just like to encourage businesses even if you can't close you know maybe give your employees next year give them maybe that little bit of time to go to the parade do whatever because you know, I, I don't think our veterans ask. I know our veterans don't ask for a lot. They don't really generally ask for anything, and they aren't even asking to be thanked. But it is our duty to thank these people who have served because we would be nothing if it wasn't for those who have protected us. I just thought of something interesting. I don't know whether you know Cheryl Hawker that works out at this park. Did you know that her father was a wingman for one of the aces of World War II? Oh, no, I didn't. No. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. She showed me a picture at his funeral. And the man looked like he could have been a Hollywood actor, plus being involved <laughs> with that. But the guy that started that became the governor of South Dakota. Holy cow. And he's also the guy that I think started the AFL, who has eventually merged with the NFL. Okay, wow. there you go. Ed, when somebody sees you when you have your Navy hat on day and, and they see you that you're a veteran and they don't know you, how do you prefer people approach a veteran? Because I know that's one of the other things that I think some of our young people in the country don't know about. What's the best way to approach? Well, most of the time they usually thank me, especially I wear it a lot because I like to talk to other veterans. And even if they don't have a hat on, they'll thank you for your service. And we do the same you know, I do the same for them all the time. Okay. Because I appreciate what they've they've done. Can I can I say what Yo, my dad yes, always please. said? People would say that to my dad all the time, and he would always say, he'd say, "I'm not a hero." He said, "I came home." It's those boys who never made it home that are the heroes. Yeah. So. One thing. We have a minute left or so with Ed and Carol today. Anything you guys want to add on this Veterans Day 2024? Oh, just. Uh, Please thank the Lord for these guys that are doing that right now. These guys and gals, actually. And the, and the guys that are first responders, the, the people that, and the people, the doctors that take care of people at the hospitals and that type of thing. But especially first responders that have to go there, the firemen, the policemen. Carolyn? I, I really can't top that, can I? But, oh, that's um, pretty good. You know, I just, I think people need to remember they need to remember why we are able to live the way we live in this country, so free and so well, and it is because of those who have fought. Lest we forget. Yes. I like that. Well, at first of all, it was great seeing you again, my old friend. It's been way too long. We had some great memories of being being the bat boy when <laughs> him and my dad coached baseball way back when. But also thank you so much for your service. Yet is U.S. veteran Navy personnel, Mr. Ed Dowling. He was the star today. Thank you so much, Ed.